Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Well, obviously, you probably can look behind me and tell where I'm at. I'm on the west side of the city of Jerusalem here in Israel. Uh, Jerusalem being the land of the Bible, but also the land of biblical prophecy. And we're actually on the roof of a hotel here. And directly behind me, you see uh, sections of the old wall. You see a very famous church up on the hill, perhaps. But for the program today is going to be very interesting because I want to talk about how do you interpret the apocalypse in the 21st century? How does a man by the name of John, John, as we know, was one of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And he was, according to one of the early fathers, he was placed in a pot of oil to, to literally be burnt to death and die in the oil. And he survived it. And then the Emperor Domitian, who persecuted Christians, sent John to the Isle of Patmos, which is in the area of the Aegean Sea, a very desolate, rocky island where some of Rome's worst political prisoners were kept. And I, I, I'm assuming that Domitian thought that John would just die there because he was already in his 90s. Uh, he was the oldest of the last uh, apostles. Uh, <clears throat> most of the apostles died somewhere between uh, 66 to about 71, 72 AD. And John was taken to the Isle of Patmos about 95 AD. So I'm sure Domitian thought, you know, he's going to die there. Instead, while he was on the island, he, he, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And the Spirit of the Lord gave him this supernatural vision uh, that we now have known as the book of Revelation. Now, the Greek word apocalypsis is the unveiling of something which is hid. So the book in Greek is called the Apocalypse. It has 22 chapters in the English translation of the Bible, but of course in the beginning it was written on one large scroll. And if you only think about the Apocalypse, it starts using a lot of symbolism of a dragon, a lamb, a woman in travail. And I was in Rome, Italy many years ago on a trip. And in fact, I can tell you where I was staying. I was staying at a hotel in Rome. We had just gone out for lunch and come back and suddenly the inspiration of the Lord came on me because I kept saying, why did you veil the book of Revelation in symbolism? It's, it's symbolism. And it's though the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, if I would have plainly told John the details, such as in chapter 17 and 18, which is mystery Babylon being destroyed in one hour with fire, and told him that one day Rome would be destroyed, they would have considered the book a book against the Roman Empire. Nero had already burnt Rome, uh, Circus Maximus down, seven-eighths of, of uh, Circus Maximus has been destroyed, and that's why Paul was beheaded. He was accused of the fire. And so Roman authorities would never have allowed John to come off the Isle of Patmos with the scroll of the Apocalypse if God had not veiled it in symbolism. And I really feel like that's the reason why God used the symbolism that he did is to veil certain things in John's day to protect the book. Now, the question I have is this, how does a man who was living over well over 1800, between 1800 to 1900 years ago, over 1900 years ago, how does he write about events which he sees taking place thousands of years later and then record them and tell us um, what's happening? Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you is there were, some, there were some verses in the apocalypse that are very, very, very strange. There is, for example, chapter 9, where this pit is opened, and these, these they, they, they call them demonic spirits, but they're like locusts, but they have this very strange appearance. They come up out of the earth, and they torment men for a period of time. Now, modern interpreters have said, could this be underground military bases, could this be a form of military helicopters that will be invented that will be painted to look like locusts? And I even found one one time that someone sent me on the internet and uh, it literally looked like, it looked like a locust. And I'm thinking, well, now this is getting really strange. 
So what I want to do for the next few moments is go back into history and move forward to today and share some things with you. Now, when we go back to the time of the first century, we have to understand that from the, from the time of the 12 apostles up to the death of John in about 100 AD, most of the people in the early church, what we call the first century church, believed that Jesus the Messiah could return in their lifetime. And of course, uh, part of that was because of a statement that Jesus made that is recorded in the last chapter of St. John's Gospel concerning Peter and concerning John. What is it to you if he tarry till I come? And even, even John who wrote St. John's Gospel said that there was a saying that went around all the apostles that that apostle would not die and would see the Lord's return, but he didn't say he wouldn't die. He just said to Peter, what is it to you if uh, this disciple is still around, speaking of John, when I return? So in the first, let's say from about 33 AD to about 100 AD, the first century church was aware that of the persecution with Nero, the persecution with Emperor Domitian and others. And so they understood that their times seemed to indicate that there was going to be uh, um, the soon return of the Lord. Now, at the death of John, which happened again, according to a scholar, Rick Renner, about 100 AD, something began to happen in the theological thinking of the second and third century believers. And what you begin to see, and I have all the writings of the Antinocene Fathers and the Post-Nicene Fathers, Nicene Fathers and that type of thing. So I, I have all those volumes, it's just huge volumes, not on the internet, but actually, you know, the physical books. And <clears throat> something began to happen about the time of the death of the apostle. Now, you, it began with Nero, it goes to Domitian, and there's eight other emperors, Roman emperors, that brought this terrible, terrible persecution for several hundred years. And they were killing people, beheading people, arresting people. They were doing all sorts of things to persecute anyone that was a believer. And so, what happened is about 100 AD all the way to about the uh, fourth century to the time of Emperor Constantine, there was this great persecution. So the second and third century believers, they, became, they began to teach on the possible appearance of the Antichrist, which would be a man who would organize a kingdom. Also uh, about the time that the Western branch of the Roman Empire fell in 476 AD, they noted that 10 Germanic tribes moved into Italy and moved into all that area of the, what we call the Western Empire, the Western Roman Empire. And so the idea became, is it possible that these tribes could be the 10 kings that are mentioned both by the, uh, Daniel in his prophetic book and also by John in the Apocalypse. So my point is that the theological thinking moved from 33 AD to 100 AD from the idea of Christ could come at any time, the Messiah could come at any time, we're living in the time of the end because there was, even reading the New Testament, you can see this, but it began to shift to the idea of tribulation, antichrist and persecution. Now that then began to shift in about the fifth century. Again, we had another shift. So in other words, we shifted from the first century anticipating the return of the Lord to the second, third, and right at fourth century, severe persecution against believers who began to teach the Roman Empire being the system of the beast and the, the division of the empire between East and West and all these other things were happening at that time. So they became very persecution conscious because they were being persecuted. Again, 10 persecutions that you can find in the history uh, of what we call Roman Empire history, the first couple hundred years against believers. Now. When Constantine the Great came to become emperor of Rome, and there, I'm not gonna get into the story of how he became a believer, but when he became a believer, he began to ease up all the persecution against uh, the Christians and made Christianity the legal religion of the empire. Now, when that began to happen, the theology of the church began to change again. So it shifted from the Lord could come at any time then for hundreds of years it was, we're in the time of persecution and the soon revealing of the Antichrist and tribulation. But then when the persecution ceased, we, it came to a teaching that, okay, now the kingdom of God has come to the earth through the church. So from the fifth and sixth century onward, there was an idea in the Roman church that 
uh, the Pope was the vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ on earth, that the church was the kingdom on earth, and they were to establish the kingdom all through Europe and all the known world at that time. So this is where the, the you know, in, if we go back in history, the Pope, the Cardinals, the bishops began to take the authority of thrones and kings and began to actually, through history, set up who would be kings and rulers in parts of Europe and that type of thing. And so the idea then became that the church is the kingdom and that since Israel did not exist as a nation, that there was no place for it in history. And all this comes into what's called, uh, today it's called kingdom now or dominion theology. And that went through its time frame as well. Now, again, things began to shift when the Byzantines, who were the Christian empire in the east, took control after Rome fell in the west, and the Byzantines for 1,000 years uh, ruled much of the Middle East and parts of Europe out of Byzantinium, which is now Constantinople and Turkey. And they minted their own coins. They had gold coins. In fact, in the Holy Land, you can find the ruins of what's called a Byzantine church almost everywhere that there was a major biblical event that took place. So the Byzantine Empire lasted for 1,000 years till the 15th century when Islam took over the area that we now know as Turkey, which was Asia Minor in the biblical time. And they took over the area of Constantinople, uh, which today is called Istanbul, Turkey. And then an empire was formed called the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which uh, controlled three uh, nations, 27 provinces, and at one time was in control of the city of Jerusalem. In fact, from 1517, when they came into Jerusalem, a lot of the upper walls of the old city, the upper part, was rebuilt by the Turks. It took many years to rebuild. So a lot of the upper part of the old walls of the city of Jerusalem were, re were rebuilt by the Turks, meaning they weren't there necessarily in the time of Christ. You've got to remember, this city went through wars uh, between crusade, crusaders and Muslims, etc. And so what happened is for 400 years, and finally in, in 1917, Edmund Allen became to Jerusalem and liberated Jerusalem from the hands of the Turks. Later, it was uh, at the, this part of Jerusalem, actually the west side was annexed for the area of Israel. And that leaves us at that point. Now that's a little bit of the history of prophecy as it relates to first century to our present time. Now, I wanna ask you a question. I wanna ask you the following questions. How would you consider John's day versus today in understanding this verse? Jesus will come back, Revelation 1, 7, every eye shall see him. How would that have been possible in John's day when people are scattered all throughout the earth through different empires? How could every eye see him? Revelation 13 verse 17 says this, every man will be forced to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead that no man can buy and sell without the name or the number of the beast or the mark of the beast. Now, how would that have been possible in the time of the apostle John? Number three, Revelation chapter 18 verse 10, the city, this is Mystery Babylon, will be destroyed in one hour. Now, because in John's day, all of the cities were made out of rock and stone, if you set a fire, it would take days for the fire to burn, to burn the wood. And a lot of times, unless they toppled the stones, which is the way the Romans did at the destruction of the temple here in the city of Jerusalem, uh, it would take days to burn. In fact, when Nero burnt Rome and an area called Circus Maximus, we're told by historians, it burnt seven out of eight days, or some say six out of seven, others say seven out of eight. And it would just burn on, it burnt for days. So here this city is destroyed in one hour. Now my question is, how would that have been possible to have taken place in John's day? Here's another one for you. Revelation 8 and 7. One third of the grass and the trees, uh, vegetation, etc., is going to be destroyed somewhere in the future. How would that have been possible in John's day? Revelation 16 verse 12. The Euphrates River, which is the border of Iraq and Iran, is going to dry up. How is that possible in John's day to take place? And then in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, says there'll be a temple that will be on the Temple Mount in the future. How is that possible with the Temple Mount being under the control of Islam? Now, while I don't have forever to answer these questions, I want to just throw some things out there for you to, you know, to understand and to contemplate. Here we go. Revelation 1, 7, for every eye to see the Lord, there has to be a technology developed 
in which the different nations of the world can be watching something at one time. The only way that would have been possible is modern time through not only satellite imagery, but now, as you know, we have Facebook and we have Skype. I mean, you can literally, if you have a good connection, hit a button and I'm talking to people back home and I'm showing pictures on my telephone. So we know that technology is changing every three months. We know that they have little drones now that uh, take pictures that are the size of bees. The U.S. military has those. That's not a rumor. That's not fake. We know that technology is changing to the point that every eye around the world at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back, this is in Revelation 19, Zechariah 14, all it takes is a camera hooked up either to a satellite or hooked up to modern technology. And when it's hooked up to modern technology, you will discover that you will be able to uh, see, every eye will be able to see him, all right? And that's point one. Now here's point number two, ready? How can every man, Revelation 13, receive a mark in their hand or in their forehead? How can that happen uh, without, in John's day, every man receiving a mark? Are you kidding me? Well, let me say this to you. This is very important. That because of computers today, because of special tattoos today, because of special chips today, a chip can be placed in someone's hand right here. They're doing this now. And you can scan and get into a door. You can scan and get into your house. You can scan and you can uh, actually do banking be with, with that particular type of scan. Uh, tattoos, you used to have to put an actual tattoo that, that was visible. Now in the United States, you can put a tattoo in your hand that's invisible and they can scan the tattoo. Now there comes a time when you can't buy or sell this is, now you think about this, this is 1900 years ago. How does a man write about this 1900 years ago and says it is a global economic system that you can't buy or sell without a number. Look, everybody's got a number. You have a social security number, you got a phone number, you got an address, you have a, a pin number on the back of your credit cards. Everybody operates by a number. In fact, you're, you're, you're really not even known by your name anymore. You are known by your number. Now, if you go to some of the theme parks in the States, this is really interesting, they have a card, and you put your hand on a scanner, and it counts the, the, the fingerprints, and it transfers it into a number on that card. So, you just scan the card, and they know who it is. They know that you've come into the park. They know where you are every time you use the scanner. Of course, they do that for security purposes as well. We are the first generation, ladies and gentlemen, first generation, that can actually see how all of these events are going to take place. No other generation before us could say that. So what I'm saying to you is that when you go into, for example, a city being destroyed in one hour, before 1948, uh, back in the 1930s, that could have never happened. But the United States used nuclear weapons in Japan on two cities, and in, in less than an hour, the entire area was completely annihilated. So my point is that I can go through all of these scriptures. I can talk about the Euphrates. It can dry up through a, fan, through a drought, but also Turkey controls dams that come into the Euphrates River, which can be controlled today. So my point is this, that when we read the, the prophecies of either the Old Testament or the New, People often look at those and say, well, that was written a long time ago by some man who was just on an island. He didn't know what he was talking about. But when you go into the details of breaking it down, it absolutely makes sense in the 21st century that a man 1900 years ago can see events taking place in the 21st century. Here's what this means to me and it should mean to you that when you open up the Bible and read it, it is inspired by God himself. The Torah is inspired of God. The prophets are inspired by God. And even the apostles that wrote the prophecies in the New Testament are inspired by the Lord. So I want to encourage you to begin to study the prophetic side of the Word of God. Prophecy is God pre-writing the headline. Did you know that God predicted thousands of years ago Israel would be a nation again. Did you know he predicted thousands of years ago that Jerusalem would be the capital at the time of the end? Did you know he predicted thousands of years ago that the Jewish people would return from all the nations of earth back to this city? You can't deny the prophets that are two, three, and 4,000 years ago 
were inspired to write these things and now you come here and you get to see all of the events come to place. There's no people on earth that have ever existed. Now think about this. No people on earth have ever existed that lost their land, lost their city, lost their language and were dispersed that ever came back after thousands of years to the same city with the same people, with the same language. It's never happened. Yet, Almighty God said it was gonna take place. And so I encourage you to have faith in your heart and believe in your heart that these things are true and real. And that's why we wanted to come to you from Jerusalem and share with you how the apocalypse makes sense in the 21st century. Now, most of you that know, if you keep up with the program, that we're gonna make something available to those of you in the States that can help us to continue keeping it coming to you around the world. So you folks in the States are helping us to reach the entire world, every nation, just about every continent, including Russia, the Ukraine, Israel, Jordan, all these other nations that physically you can't go into and minister perhaps because you're only one person. You're helping us to do that. So stay with us to the very end and see some of our conferences and things that's going to be happening in the future. Thank you for joining me today on Manifest, but please stay tuned. He is coming and the world is ignorant of his arrival and the dangers of his kingdom. Some early fathers suggested that Emperor Nero would return from the dead as this man. Because of certain scriptures, some Greek scholars teach Judas Iscariot, called a son of perdition, will rise from the underworld to incarnate this future demonic-controlled individual, leading the world toward military annihilation. Others note that Hitler had certain biblical parallels that are predicted about this man, the man known as the Antichrist. In this DVD, is the Antichrist alive? Perry digs into the early church history and Greek word studies tying prophetic scriptures together to present an accurate and enlightening narrative of what to expect with the Antichrist and his kingdom. You will hear this and much more. Along with this DVD is Perry's book, The Eighth Kingdom, which explains how radical Islam will impact the end times. This book is a detailed highlight from Perry's blockbuster book, Unleashing the Beast. You will read of the six major empires in the world that have risen and fallen and how a seventh empire is coming but will be swallowed up by an Islamic empire coming out of the Middle East. You will also read about the link between biblical and many Islamic prophecies and what they all have in common. You will discover the return of the ancient spirit of Babylon and be given another look at the mark of the beast. The Eighth Kingdom is coming and this book will expose stunning information. This is a very timely offer, especially with the threat of global terrorism and the nuclear war drums beating in rogue nations. This DVD and book are available for a limited time, but can be yours now for a donation of just $30 or more. Order by calling 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323 or online at perrystone.org. You may also write us and enclose your donation of $30 or more and request offer EK127. Our address is Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. This is a major prophetic resource and the time to expose and explain the eighth kingdom is now. We look forward to hearing from you. You know, what you're watching are brand new programs from Israel that were taped recently and for the next couple weeks and actually months, every program will be new. Please tell someone about the telecast and have them to join in and watch because you're going to learn a lot. And we also have a number of brand new locations that we've never taped at before. Just new backgrounds, walls, cities, ruins, uh, Petra, for example, in Jordan. Please be a part of this. Uh, we want you to, to, to watch. And also don't forget the offer is new and you want to get this if you love Bible prophecy. You're gonna spend hours studying with me the Word of God with this new offer. I've got about 30 seconds I wanna share something with you. I'm coming to Healing Place Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, one service only, Wednesday, April the 4th. 
Then on April the 22nd, which is a Sunday, we have Resurrection Life Church in Granville, Michigan, all day Sunday. And then we're coming to Princeton Pike, May the 4th through the 6th in Hamilton, Ohio, Princeton Pike Church of God for a conference. And we have a lot of uh, meetings planned with uh, different things, and you're gonna see some of those advertised. We hope you can come and be a part of what God is doing. And speaking of what God is doing, I just want to say that uh, we are blessed to be able to uh, compile information from individuals who uh, work in different parts of the world. Uh, some of them are very significant in their positions. Uh, and we or were able to take information that a lot of times is not uh, advertised in the media or spoken of in the media. Nothing secretive about it. It's just not commonly known. And then we can tie it in with what the scriptures are teaching concerning the events of the time of the end, concerning the signs of the return of the Lord, etc. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm also grateful, you know, our partner's director, uh, Tiffany uh, King, was able to go to the Holy Land with her parents and we were able to tape on location like 60 to two minute nuggets. And of course, if you're a partner, you get those and you see them on location in Israel. And uh, this, this may be one of the most uh, talked about things that we've done in the history of our ministry because, you know, sometimes when you preach, I know when I minister, sometimes I get a little lengthy in my messages and in the sermons and some of the things I do uh, because I have 60 minutes or 70 minutes and I'll just try to pour everything in. And every now and then, it's just that one nugget, that one phrase, that one scripture, that one word study that just pops out in your heart and spirit. And then it gets inside of your spirit and it begins to kind of burn in your heart and burn your spirit. So we're grateful for the opportunity of the technology that's available today to bring you the Word of God. I also want to greet all of the different students around the world that are a part of the ISO Bible School. And you're getting all those courses and learning those courses. And thank you and God bless you. And we're getting a fabulous response from so many of you that said, I've learned something I did not know. I've studied this subject my entire life and learned things just constantly. So bless you and thank God for you. And we believe that uh, the ISO International School of the Word is going to one day literally reach all over the world into all the nations of the world and help train pastors, evangelists, prophets, and teachers, and apostles for the end time ministry. And so th these are just exciting times to be alive. Look, I'll be back next week. God bless you. You can't overpower God. You can't defeat God. You can't overthrow God. And if you're a Christian, then say Jesus because he's the founder of the Christian faith. As long as we're here, the people of God, then God is not finished with this nation. We're called to intercede for this nation to get on our knees until the bitter, bloody end. Harry Stone invites you to join him for his 2018 Israel tour. The dates are November 19th through the 28th with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today.